Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today what we're going to do is spend a little bit of time talking about electronegativity. Now it is a topic we've already talked about before, uh, but today it gets to shine, it gets the spotlight right on itself here. Um, and really it's the idea of how badly an atom wants electrons, which is not that different than electron affinity, but this is dealing with the idea of within a chemical bond. So we should probably review a little bit about chemical bonds. Remember that bond energy of chemical bonds is the usually measured in kilojoules per mole. And that's how much energy it takes to break a typical bond, um, or the energy that's released uh, when that bond is formed. It's a very good indicator of the strength of a bond. Now again, this is a typical bond. Most bonds are going to be formed in an exothermic reaction. The products are more stable than the reactants. And so if you want to break that bond, you've got to put the energy back in. Think about like the formation of water and then the electrolysis of water to break it back apart. But we can also create unstable bonds where we're putting energy in to form the bond and energy is stored in the bond and then the energy is released when it's broken. But it all sort of follows the law of conservation of energy. There is a relationship between bond length and bond strength, typically. Short bonds tend to be stronger, long bonds tend to be weaker. And so, you know, here's a good pattern of that right here. We've got diatomic hydrogen, diatomic iodine. You'll notice that the iodine is a much weaker bond uh, because it's longer. Now, we've talked about the idea of what makes something ionic and what makes something covalent. Uh, ionic being a transfer of electrons, covalent being a sharing, and we've always said, well, metals and nonmetals like to make ionic bonds, and nonmetals and nonmetals like to make covalent bonds, uh, but that's always sort of been wishy-washy and, and kind of qualitative. Uh, there is a way to quantitatively decide whether something's going to be ionic or covalent, and even shades of ion, I mean, shades of covalent. And that really depends on how badly the individual elements want electrons, uh, and then comparing them. And that's really what electronegativity is. Now, that's going to sound an awful lot like electron affinity, and it's very similar. The big difference is that this is dealing with, again, specifically a chemical bond. So it's the pull, the desire for an atom within a chemical bond to pull the electrons towards itself. And it's a much simpler concept because it's measured all in positive values, from 0.7 being the weakest to 4 being the strongest, cesium to fluorine. The basic concept of electronegativity and the quantitative measurement of such, uh, I think, is given credit to a guy named Linus Pauling. Um, and that's why it starts, you know, like why didn't it start at, at zero? Well, it's be because of the calculations he worked out. Now, technically, francium would be a little less, but since there's not much francium on the planet, it doesn't make much sense. And so imagine like a tug-of-war card game and where you had little kids and you're working out the tug-of-war values for those, those kids. Uh, again, a 0.7 would be a pretty weak tug-of-war kid, uh, while a 4.0 would be the strongest kid in the, in the playground. And so the higher the value, the, the stronger the desire is for electrons, and that's going to correlate nicely to electron affinity. Um, and again, it's going to follow all the same trends. And just like that, we're going to ignore the noble gases because, remember, they don't like to form bonds anyway, so we really don't worry about their electronegativity value. And so the trends of this follow the trends that you would expect for electron affinity. As I go down the family, the radius is going to get bigger. Right? The electrons are going to be farther away, and that includes new electrons, so there's going to be a weaker pull. And so you're going to expect to see bigger elements have weaker electronegativity values. And the horizontal trend matches exactly what you would think also. As I go left to right, remember the radius is going to get smaller. Uh, that means new electrons can get closer to the nucleus, and so they're going to be pulled in tighter. So as I move to the right, you would expect higher electronegativity values also. And so that you would imagine the top right corner sands the noble gases to have the strongest electronegativity values, just like you'd expect them to have the strongest desire or the most exothermic electron, electron affinities. And so by looking at electronegativity, we can determine whether or not we've got an equal sharing of electrons. And so all you do is you look at the absolute difference between the values. And here's a chart right here of electronegativities. You can get your own off the periodic table. They're not that hard to find. Um, but you'll see the general trends of, of going left to right. They tend to get bigger. Going uh, down a family, they tend to get smaller. And so you can determine any two elements. Again, they can be part of a larger compound, but looking at the specific bond between any two elements, you can look at the absolute difference. And the absolute difference is going to determine the type of bond that it has. If it's a really big difference, then expect to see an ionic bond. And if it's less of a difference, then it's going to be more covalent or equal in character. Now, I will tell you that some people are going to argue about where these breakpoints are for the three types. Um, but, you know, again, it's, they're all pretty similar in regards to where the breakpoints are. Remember that this is all a gradient, and so there's not a real big difference between uh, the, far, the high side of one side and the low side of another side. 
Um, you know, so don't get too hung up on the exact values. But if there's not much of an electronegativity difference, like for instance with uh, diatomics, where you're going to have equal tug of war no matter what the strength is, uh, you're going to have a true pure covalent bond, also considered nonpolar covalent bonds, where you'll have a pretty much an equal sharing of electrons right in the middle. Now, if it starts being uh, dominated by one element, uh, where the electronegativity differences get a little higher, well, then you're going to start seeing it. It's still going to be sharing, but an unequal sharing, sort of like when you're playing with your siblings and your parents are watching. You know, you still have to play with all the toys, but you can certainly gather many of the to toys closer to you. So you're still sharing, but, you know, not really. And then if the parents aren't watching, then you take all the toys, and it's a complete transfer of toys. And then if it's a complete transfer, you end up with an ionic bond. And again, it's a pretty simple idea. Now, if you're right on the breakpoints, you're going to have to really deal with the experience and decide, okay, well, you know, does it make sense to make this polar covalent or ionic, depending, or non-polar covalent, where the breakpoints are. So experience helps a lot, you know, depending on the covalent or ionic nature of a bond. So let's look at some example problems here. Um, you know, we've, we've, let's list some bonds here the electronegativity differences of each of these. Now again, assume these are in a giant compound. Um, obviously diatomic hydrogen wouldn't be. Anytime you see an element bonded with itself, that's right, a zero difference, so that would be flatly nonpolar covalent. Uh, let's see what's next here. Uh, 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 like a rubidium bromine uh, bond. Uh, that's If you look at the difference there, again, you can go ahead and look at a chart. Um, that's going to be 2.0, so that's going to be an ionic bond. And that makes sense. That's a metal and a non-metal. Same with sodium chloride. That would make sense. That would be an ionic bond. Uh, fluorine and chlorine are going to be two non-metals, so you'd expect that to be a covalent bond. What we'll find is that's an unequal sharing. Fluorine is highly electronegative, so even dealing with the halogen right next to it, it's got a pretty strong pull in a bond. Um, calcium and uh, sulfur. Um, again, uh, you, you, that's, that's leaning towards ionic, but it's actually technically more towards a polar covalent. Um, in terms of electronegativity differences. Calcium on oxygen is squarely ionic. That's a much bigger difference. Hydrogen and oxygen, uh, you'll see this all the time, by the way. You'll see a hydrogen and oxygen bond that's a 1.4. That's, a, that's a, a classic polar covalent bond, unequal sharing, but still sharing. And then carbon and hydrogen, you'll see a lot too. Um, technically, that's slightly polar covalent bond there also. Again, now in certain books, you'll see that listed as a non-polar covalent bond, but it's an unequal sharing of electrons. Um, but just barely. And so that's really about it for today. I just want to introduce the concept of electronegativity. Now, electronegativity is going to be key for the rest of this chapter because what we're going to do is we're going to learn about how the structure of covalent compounds is formed. Um, we already know about ionic compounds and crystal lattices, so we don't have to really talk about that now. And once we look at the 3D structure, we can then tie that into electronegativity. And by looking at the 3D structure, and the type of bonds involved, which sounds complex, but um, it's not so bad, we can actually figure out what kind of physical interactions covalent molecules will have. Those are called intermolecular forces. And again, I'm, I'm sort of uh, teasing ahead on that kind of stuff, but uh, intermolecular forces are really the reason that we're alive today, so they're, they're pretty important. Big things come in small packages. And so with that little uh, uh, cliffhanger there, uh, we'll, we'll let you go. Um, so thanks for watching, and have a great day.